because we are the church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against us. And yet that declaration implicitly declares to us that it's not enough for us to just simply be saved. We have to connect with our God-given destiny. And it's in that place of being in God's will that hell will not prevail against us. Because I don't know about you, I know a lot of Christians that are utterly defeated. They are not living the victorious life that Christ has called them to live. And so I believe a large part of whether or not you walk in victory is whether or not you connect with your destiny. Father, we just thank you today for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's in this place. We thank you, Lord. You said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so we believe you are here. And we believe you're going to speak today, Lord God. We declare we are hungry and we are ready. And we thank you for all you've done thus far, Lord. And, but we're also ready for what you're going to do right now as your word goes forth in power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I, I've been so blessed. Uh, I've been reading uh, George Whitfield's um, uh, journals every night. And um, it's, it's such a, 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 you know, a powerful... Um, record of what God did uh, through one man and you know he, he would often mention about how uh, the, the, the word of the Lord was, was present in great power and, uh, and he would talk about how God uh, you know anointed me in an unusual way and, uh, and, and how the power of God was so present um, on him in particular services and um, I really believe so strongly God's going to do that again Amen. And, uh, and so again, what you just witnessed was just the Spirit of God coming powerfully upon my wife and ministering and, and, and bringing, you know, an our word. Because, you know, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, I am he who speaks. You know, God hasn't stopped speaking. The problem is many of us have stopped listening. And, and unfortunately, sometimes churches can get into a rut of doing things um, in, in a certain way, and, and everybody gets uh, so comfortable to the point where God has to come in by His Spirit and shake things up a little bit, amen? So, you know, He was ears to hear. Uh, uh, so today we're going to finish uh, Unstoppable, and uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a par paradox, isn't it? But um, anyway, I'm going to start by reading Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 in the Message Bible. And it says, when Jesus arrived in the village of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, some think he is John the Baptist, some say Elijah, uh, some Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He pressed them, and how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus came back, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy that even the gates of hell will not be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and uh, free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth. Earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. And a no on earth is no in heaven. Praise the Lord. So we are the church and we are unstoppable. And if we ever come to the place of actually believing that, darkness will start to flee very quickly. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 in the NIV. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For all creation, the new living, for all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. I think the message puts it so um, uh, powerfully because it says, um, my father in heaven, God himself let you in on the secret of who I really am. 
And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. And I think that's such a powerful uh, uh, revelation that, that, you know, God reveals to Peter in that moment uh, who he is. And that's why the Bible says that all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. You could put it another way that all of creation is waiting for the sons of God, uh, daughters of God to discover their destiny and connect with the plan that God has for them. Amen. You see, the world is waiting for the day when we will discover who we are and what we are called, appointed, anointed, and divinely authorized by heaven to accomplish. Amen? This is so important for us to understand because we are the church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against us. And yet that declaration, you know, implicitly, um, uh, you know, declares to us that it's not enough for us to just simply be saved. We have to connect with our God-given destiny. And it's in that place of being in God's will that hell will not prevail against us. Because I don't know about you, I know a lot of Christians that are utterly defeated. They're depressed, they're full of fear, they're anxious. They're just constantly struggling with sickness and disease and all of these issues in their lives. They're not living the victorious life that Christ has called them to live. And so I believe a large part of whether or not you walk in victory is whether or not you connect with your destiny. Amen? And so, over the last number of weeks, we've spoken about three key elements. They're not exhaustive. I just, you know, all you can do is, it's a bit like when we were driving in Scotland and we passed these beautiful mountains and the beautiful vista and landscape and you try and take a picture, but all you could do is take one little glimpse of, of a ma- you, you couldn't take the panorama. You couldn't take the big picture um, in, a, in a camera. And a, a message is a bit like that. You can just take, you know, some snapshots of God's grace because none of us can plumb the depths of the revelation of God's word. And so anyway, we've spoken about three of the elements that make us unstoppable, our righteousness, our authority, and last week we started our destiny. Matthew 16 and verse 16 in the New Living. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. And you know what? If you know Jesus... You are blessed. If you are born again, you are blessed. If you are saved, you are blessed. If heaven is your home, then you are blessed. It doesn't matter what's going wrong or what's going on. You are blessed. Glory to God. Could somebody say, I believe that today. You are blessed. Simon, son of uh, Jonah, Jesus said, for my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I'll build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You see, it was only when Peter said, you are Christ, that Christ said, you are Peter. Amen. You see, the Lord knows who you are, where you are, and what he has called you to do. You see, he holds the secret to your destiny. You know, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when Jesus called Peter, he said, follow me. However, Peter, you know, made some mistakes. He had foot and mouth disease. He had a tendency to put his foot into his mouth. And uh, maybe some of you have that, I think all of us to some degree. But not only did he, you know, uh, try and talk Jesus out of the cross, Jesus had to rebuke him and cast the devil out of him in that moment. Um, or at least rebuke Peter because he was listening to the devil and uh, uh, speaking what the devil was saying. Some of you need to learn that lesson. Stop speaking everything that comes into your mind because some of those thoughts that come into your mind come straight from hell. You need to stop amplifying what the enemy is saying to you. Some of you need to change the channel and stop listening to the lies of the enemy in Jesus' name. So anyway... Um, uh, not only that, but Peter, later on, when the pressure comes on, uh, Peter crumbles. He denies Christ three times. And yet Christ lovingly, um, you know, invites him, sends an angel to mention Peter by name to show that he wasn't, uh, God wasn't finished with him. He wasn't disqualified. And not only that, Jesus sits down, has a meal with him, and, uh, and, and gives him an opportunity to confess him three times. Three times Peter denied him. Three times Jesus gets him 
to confess him. And then he finishes, uh, you know, by, by showing Peter his future, you know, that God would use him to lead the church. He would use him, uh, you know, powerfully in an, apost- in an apostolic sense. And then he finishes by saying what he had said to him in the beginning, follow me. Amen. So just as he started, he finishes by declaring, follow me. And God has given every one of us the same command to follow him. Amen. And so uh, it's very, very powerful because just like he said, follow me to Peter, he is saying, follow me to you. He wants us to answer the call to serve his purposes. Esther 4.14, surely you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, God takes a young woman uh, called Esther and uses her to bring deliverance to her entire race, to her entire nation. And, um, you know, even to this very day, the Jewish people celebrate the victory, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, the Jewish people won in that moment. And... Um, So anyway, God used her to bring deliverance, and the paradox is this, is that God's strength is expressed through this young woman's weakness. And Psalm 105 says in verse 16, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Until the time that his word came to pass. And so, like Joseph, God keeps Esther hidden until the time was right. Because he only revealed her identity you know, he, he, you know, God only reveals um, Esther's identity when it was time for her to step into her destiny. Amen. And so uh, this is the thing. Ultimately, the only difference between an acorn and an oak is time. And uh, sometimes we get frustrated because God isn't working on our uh, time scale. And so in the very same way as Esther, you may currently be hidden by God. But you know what? Be faithful where you are and with what you have and allow God to do his work in your heart because God does his deepest work in tough times and in dark places. You know, Joseph was in a dark place. He was in prison. Esther had lost her, her mom and her dad. She was living in a foreign land. And, um, and yet, Esther chapter 2 talks about how she was chosen and she spent an entire year in preparation and, um, uh, you know, for what was essentially a, a beauty contest. And uh, you might say that's so sexist and that's so uh, patriarchal. Well, you know, it's most likely because you're ugly and you would never win that. But she was beautiful, okay? And um, but be offended. But, uh, you know, we're living in a generation where they're trying to make women like men and make men like women. And I get deeply uncomfortable when I see men acting like women and women acting like men. It's okay to be beautiful if you're a woman. I've never seen a beautiful man. You are... (laughs) Some of you just woke up. (laughs) And let me just add, sometimes in the church, we've gone to extremes. And, and one of those extremes has been this hyper-spiritual thing where it's, it's not spiritual to look beautiful. It, it's not spiritual to have, uh, uh, there may be kids in the room, but physical relations with your husband. Or, uh, and, and, you know, we've seen so many marriages fail because of people going to extremes. And it's a religious spirit from hell. Okay? So just embrace who God made you to be. And, and, you know, it's like John Osteen used to say, any old barn door will look better with a fresh coat of paint. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> have, we, have we turned on the heating here or is it just me? <laughs> but God does his deepest work in dark places, tough times. So you are not invisible or unimportant, and you are not forgotten. Like Esther, you're simply in preparation. You know, I'm not going to go to the chapter, but Esther 2 talks about she spent an entire year in preparation. And it shows us this, preparation time is never wasted time. 
okay? Because in just one moment, God can bring you from where you are to where you need to be. But are you allowing God to prepare you for that moment so that when that moment comes, you can step onto that stage, you can step into that place, you can do what God has prepared you to do? Because for an entire year, she went through extensive preparations for just one day. And yet, in that one day, Esther went from being an unknown peasant to the most famous, wealthy, influential, and celebrated woman in the entire land. And not only that, God uses her to deliver the Jewish people from destruction. And so, anyway, Genesis chapter 41 and verse 41 uh, tells us this about Joseph. There's a lot of parallels in some ways between Joseph and Esther. You know, they went through dark times. But, you know, I I love where the Bible says weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, uh, Joseph didn't, like I said, didn't look like a success when he's thrown in the pit, when he was sold as a slave uh, by his brothers, when he's taken off to Egypt in chains, when he's sold on the slave block and Potiphar buys him, and then when he's falsely accused of adultery, and then when he's thrown in prison, you know, uh, supposedly uh, as everyone else to just languish in there and spend his final days in, in darkness and, and, and uh, obscurity and, and suffering. And, and yet, uh, here we see in verse uh, Genesis chapter uh, 41 and verse um, 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. You know, it's interesting that he took off those, those, those uh, stinky, dirty um, rags that he was wearing in the prison. Uh, and he shaved because the Egyptians at the time uh, had no time for a person who was, uh, had, had a beard because none of them uh, uh, w- would have worn uh, beards. And so, you know, he was dressing himself and he was preparing himself for where he was going and not for where he was. And this is the problem. Too many Christians won't do that. You'll prepare if God will put you there. But if he puts you there, you're not ready. Joseph dressed for his destiny. And God opened the door and he was able to step in. And so verse um, 41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. Do you know why? He was dressed for the part. He looked ready. He, he, you know, he, he was prepared for his moment. And, uh, and it says, Then Pharaoh took his signet ring and his hand and uh, put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him uh, ride in his second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. And so he set him over the land of Egypt. And verse 45. And it says, Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. You see, it doesn't matter how you come in. It matters how you go out. And you know what? Some of us have had some uh, struggles, some failures, some uh, things in our past. But you know what? Our story is still being written. Know this. Your story is still being written, okay? You might have gone through some, some bad chapters. But you know what? The best is yet to come in Jesus' name. You see, hallelujah. In just one day, Joseph went from the pit to the palace. From the place of punishment to the place of power. From the place of suffering to the place of success. From obscurity to prominence, from poverty to wealth, and there was literally nothing the enemy could do to stop it. You know why? He was unstoppable because when you get connected with God and you get connected with his destiny for your life, there is no power of darkness that can stop you. The enemy cannot stop your destiny, only you can. You can listen to his lies and his accusations and like so many multitudes of others, just quit and walk away from your destiny. You see, but life is too short and eternity is too long to do any less than God's best. Luke 12 and 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? You see, you have to live live for something bigger than you. John chapter 3, verse 25, John John declared, he must increase, I must decrease. You know, I think the New Living says, he must become greater and greater, I must become less and less. 
And the irony is this. In order to fulfill his destiny, John had to die to his own interests and preferences. That's why there are some Christians who are talented and who are anointed and who are called and they accomplish squid diddly. I don't know if that's a word, but they accomplish nothing. Why? Because they're always wanting to do what they want instead of what God wants. Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This was the cry of Paul's heart. It was Andrew Murray said this. Pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Andrew Murray You see, this is a warning to all of us, because let me say this, social media is feeding a narcissism in our generation that is destroying not only lives and marriages and families, but whole nations. And it grieves the heart of God. Because you see, if a person never stops talking about themselves, their opinions, their needs, their mental health, their problems, most likely it's because they are a narcissist. And it's rooted in pride and selfishness. And unfortunately, it is endemic in our society. You know, one reason why I admire the, 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 the men of what's known as the greatest generation, you know, World War II, is because these young men laid down their lives in the cause of freedom, a freedom that many of them would never enjoy themselves. And yet today, we enjoy the freedom that they purchased with their blood. You know, many of these young men, and and some of them were no older than my my son, Ewan, 18 years of age. Some of them were even younger than that, but these were just kids. And, you know, many of these young men died uh, far from their family and their friends and their home. Some of them didn't even get a proper burial. And yet, they had a sense of duty and patriotism, honor and responsibility that is sadly lacking in our generation. And that's why I wear the poppy uh, every year. I appreciate it's not very common in Ireland. And maybe some people get offended about it. But I don't care because I'm genuinely humbled by the sacrifice of these, these young men. You know, millions of men. You know, British and American and Canadian and Polish and, and Russian. And, you know, all of these men who, who, who you know, uh, fought against uh, fascism. You know, re- real fascism. No, not the one that just exists in your head because you don't like somebody's particular opinions. I think we use that phrase way too loosely if you study what the fascists did and what they stood for. Because ultimately, none of us got here alone. Somewhere, someone, somewhere fought for your freedom. And this is why we need to be humble and grateful to God for this precious gift of freedom. I'm so glad that we are able to gather here today and worship. I'm so glad that we are to to live in a free nation where we have people going out in the street preaching the gospel. You see, we need to be grateful, but this is the thing. Proud people are never grateful. They're so wrapped up in themselves. They're never grateful. And you see, let me say this, if you're not humble, God will know it, and in time, he may show it. If you're proud, God will expose that. If your heart is not right before him, he will expose that. And I believe that's what the Spirit of God was saying to my wife earlier, because let let me say this, we are in the end days, Jesus is coming back, and God is, he's turning up the lights, And the lights are going to start exposing some things that are not very uh, pleasant. And so the Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. There's a time and a place to deal with your stuff. But if you refuse to deal with it, God will. If you refuse to deal with it in private, God may deal with it in public. Too many times... We speak of destiny from a perspective of pride, arrogance, ambition, and selfish interest. And yet none of these were evident in John when he humbly chose to step aside for Christ and say, you know what, he must become greater, I must become less. And neither was it present in Christ when, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he chose to humble himself and declare, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Amen? You know, Philippians chapter 2, you know, addresses this this very thing in verse 6. 
And it says, Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, just declare that name right now. Just declare that name. Jesus. Declare it like your life depended on it. Jesus. Because it does. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. You see, when the weakest believer, when the most baby believer takes that name on their lips, all of hell starts to shake. Glory to God. When you use that name, demons run. When you use that name, powers of darkness are broken. Chains and shackles are shattered at the name of Jesus. Because the Bible says the name of Jesus is the name that is above every name. Hallelujah. Whether it's in heaven, whether it's in earth, or whether it's in hell itself. Glory to God. And he has given us his name. Praise God. That's why we can put the devil running. It's not because we're so good or so holy or so virtuous or so worthy, but because of the name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Just declare today, Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, declare like you mean it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God, because when you make that declaration, the devil starts to back off because he knows she's God's property. The devil knows he's God's property. I can't mess with him. He's got the name. He's got the name that has crushed, you know, demons through the, through the ages. He's got the name that has crushed Satan itself. He's the name that has defeated death. Hallelujah. Defeated the grave. Defeated darkness. There is nothing you can face that is bigger or greater than the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Give a shout of praise to the Lord. Just say that name one more time. Jesus! Oh, Jesus. Lord, we want to declare that name over Dublin. Come on. Jesus! Oh, hallelujah. We declare it over Ireland. Jesus! Thank you, Jesus. The name of Jesus. It says he humbled himself. And I have to humble myself right now and acknowledge I have one more part. But Sandrine told me, seven is the number of God's perfection. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Can we just begin to pray right now for, for Ireland? You know, my heart breaks because I talk to parents. I talk to, you know, so many parents talk to me. And, and listen, we love everybody. We love everybody. And God loves everybody. But there is a very dark agenda right now to indoctrinate our children. And there's so many parents that are under severe pressure because their children are being taught things that they don't agree with, particularly regarding to gender and sexuality. And I don't mean to deal with it every week, but the reality is, whether you want to deal with it as an adult, your children are having to deal with it in the schools. And so, again, we love everybody, but you know what? Loving your neighbor and endorsing their behavior are not the same thing. And so we need to pray for our children because they are going into a world that, that we, we did not have to go into. They are hearing things in school, seeing things in school that we never heard or saw. And that's just a fact. And so we have to pray. We have to pray in Jesus' name because God has a destiny for our children. Amen. The Bible says, great shall be the peace of your children. And you know, we need to stand in the gap for our precious children in Jesus' name. You know, children are an inheritance 
from the Lord. And we refuse to allow the devil to steal our inheritance and to take them down a pathway that will lead them to, to torment, confusion, and ultimate destruction. Hell no. It's not going to happen in Jesus' name. We stand in the gap. And, and you know, I know I'm in the middle of my message, but you know what? Let's just pray for our children right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for our children. Lord, we pray for our precious children and for all of the children in this nation. I know you love them, Lord, and you have a plan. You have a purpose. You have a destiny for the children of this nation. And devil, we declare that you will not have the children. You will not take them. You will not confuse them. You will not destroy them in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for our precious children today in Jesus' name. We stand in the gap. Amen. You might not have children, but you can stand in the gap for somebody else's children because ultimately... They are gods, and he has a plan. He has a purpose for them, and he does not want them to be confused. Amen. And, and Lord, I know there are people who will not understand. There are people who will not be able to appreciate where we're coming from, Lord. But we're not apologizing for what we believe, and we're not apologizing for what your word says with regards to gender, with regards to sexuality, Lord God. We stand in the gap for our children, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, because there's a battle for our children. There's a battle on on social media there's a battle you know all of our kids have some kind of a, a, an electronic device and you know what there's some very dangerous people uh, you know uh, in that world and for some of us we don't necessarily understand that world so well but Lord we pray in the name of Jesus for our children that you will keep them just as you kept the children of Israel Lord God when the angel of death came to destroy he could not touch them because they were under the blood and we declare that our children are under the blood of Jesus. They are under the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Their minds are covered by the blood of Jesus. And we declare the devil, you will not have them. You will not influence them. You will not pervert them. You will not confuse them. You will not destroy them. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We declare our children will serve the Lord. We declare as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Come on. Pray, people. Let's pray for our children in Jesus' name. Lord God, we pray, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, not just for Ireland, but for, for much of the world that is bought into this woke ideology and is, you know, uh, instead of just educating or seeking to indoctrinate, Lord, we pray that our, our schools will come back to a place where they're just simply educating and not pushing political viewpoints and pushing, you know, uh, ideologies and agendas that are inconsistent with who we are and what we stand for as believers in Jesus' name. We pray for our children, Lord God. Make our children as lights in dark places, Lord God. Use them, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Use our children, Lord God. Touch our children, Lord. You know, some of you have got children that are far from God. But you know what? The Lord was able to reach the prodigal, and he's going to be able to reach your child wherever he or she may be. Lord God, reach them. Reach the prodigals, Lord God. Where could the time has come for them to be called back, Lord God. Let that call go out in the spirit for all of those who are lost, Lord. All of those who are in dark all of those who are in sin, all of those who are far from you, Lord God, touch our children in the name of Jesus Christ. Touch our children in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit of God, have your way. Have your way among us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for those times where we have just chosen to, to vegetate in front of a TV or a computer or, or just silently scroll together. Lord, God. Help us, Lord God, to, to, to minister to our children. Help us to, to reach them where they are, to touch them at the point of their need. In Jesus' name, Lord God, move in the hearts of our children. We declare, devil, you cannot have them. You will not prevail. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Spirit of God. Move on the hearts of our children, Lord God. Touch their hearts, Lord, particularly for those of, uh, uh, you know, whose hearts have grown hard, Lord. And, and you know, just, just like my wife prayed earlier, Lord, if our hearts have grown hard, Lord God, if we have fallen back from where we are, Lord God, if, if we have grown insensitive to your voice, I pray that you will stir our hearts again, stir our hearts again to pray and to cry out to you and to lift our voices, Lord. Lord, we know that all revival starts with prayer and all revival ends when the people stop praying. So, Lord,
Lord God, we repent of our prayerlessness. You know what? Whether or not you got kids in school, we need to repent of the fact we haven't been praying like we should for the next generation. Glory to God. We pray for them today. Come on, people. Lift your voices. Do you know how to pray? Come on. Do you know how to lift your voices in prayer? Glory to God. God's not going to move unless we know how to pray. We need to rediscover prayer. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Do you understand that your destiny is connected with your relationship with God? And that is why we must pray. We must pray and seek his face because we want to know him. We want to know his voice. We want to hear his voice. We want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed to the day of redemption. Lord, you've called us to shine for you. You've called us to shine. Hallelujah. You've called us to shine, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to come back to that place, that place of simplicity, that place of humility, that place of hunger in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for stirring our hearts. Oh, Lord God, we bless our little babies. We bless our children, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We stand in the gap for our our children. We stand in the gap for the young people of this generation in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We come against the addiction, the pornography, the perversion, the lies that they have been taught, Lord God. You know, the lies, Lord God, that the next generation has been taught. We pray. We stand in the gap in Jesus' name. Lord, we stand in the gap. We're standing in the gap in Jesus' name. And we declare, Lord, we're going to see a mighty revival. We're going to see a great awakening in Jesus' name. We're going to see an awakening in Jesus' name. Let that awakening come, Lord God. Stir our hearts. Stir our hearts, Lord God. Stir our hearts, Lord God. Wake us up in the night that we may pray. Wake us up in the morning that we may seek your face, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord God, thank you, Father, for just as you gave my wife those tears. I thank you, Lord. You're going to give us tears for a lost and a broken generation in Jesus' name. You know, Charles Spurgeon referred to tears as liquid prayers. And so, Lord God, let those liquid prayers come again in Jesus' name. Let those, let those, those wet eyes come again, Lord God. Let people be broken before you. Let people be convicted. Don't let us be businesslike in how we approach you, Lord God. Let us come before you in humility and brokenness and repentance and with a desire to hear your voice, with a desire to do your will, with a desire to lay our lives down in your cause in Jesus' name. Shia just like Hudson Taylor, he said, if I had a thousand lives, I'd give them all for China. Lord God, help us lay, to lay our lives down in your cause, in Jesus' name. You know, I want us to pray for a moment for Gen Z. You know, America is a warning to the world. What we're seeing there, what we're seeing is a division and a polarization that has been deliberately fermented because, uh, are fomented with an agenda to, to create instability uh, sufficient to overturn a nation. And it's not just about a nation. I believe if America falls, the world falls. And, uh, you know, one of the things they saw from this recent election is that, uh, you know, I know it, it kind of went fairly equally between, uh, you know, left and right, between, uh, you know, red and blue. But overwhelmingly, Gen Z, the younger generation, voted in, in favor of the Democrats. And, uh, you know, the Democrats are anything but democratic uh, in what they stand for. Because killing babies is not democratic, it's not godly, and it's not Christian. And any church or, 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 or minister or Christian who says uh, you know, that they stand for that are sadly deluded. They do not know the heart of God. And I, I very much doubt whether they will ever see heaven. Because you, know, you cannot stand against uh, the life that God himself creates, irrespective of how... Um, 
you know, um, uh, how that life comes into being. That is a human person. That is a human being. And yet, they voted overwhelmingly because of the right for abortion and, uh, you know, free stuff. This idea that things are, are free, which is really rooted in Marxist thought. And uh, it's a lie. Any nation that has embraced that view, whether, you know, uh, Venezuela or Cuba or, or any other nation that has, you know, uh, embraced communism, it's always just brought the exact same result, uh, death, destruction, and, and slavery, and, uh, and, uh, along with poverty. And, and, and so, again, we need to be praying for the younger generation because, unfortunately, um, many of them are being brainwashed um, on social media to uh, uh, embrace values that are utterly inconsistent with the values you would have taught them as a parent and certainly utterly inconsistent with the values that the Bible uh, proposes, the Bible declares. You know, God commands all men everywhere to repent and so we're not standing in judgment or condemnation. Repentance starts here. Repentance starts in our hearts when we deal with our stuff. Amen. And, uh, and so, listen, we need to come to church with a new attitude with a new hunger, with a new desire, you know, to worship, to pray, and to hear, and to live this life. Because you know what? Jesus said, by your fruits you will be known. And this is the problem. There's too many people are Sunday Christians, and the other six days, they're living for the devil, and that's not how God wants us to live. Amen? So Lord, we pray for the younger generation, particularly those who literally never have a phone out of their hands. And let me say this. If, if we want to see revival, we're going to have to put these down, and we're going to have to take this up in Jesus' name. Amen? We're going to have to take this up. And we're going to have to, again, get back on our knees and start praying. And start praying for our children, for our brothers, our sisters, our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues. People we don't even know. Do you know one of the things that blessed me about George Whitfield was that, you know, he, he was traveling uh, uh, over, over the Atlantic to go to Georgia, which was like the ends of the earth back then. It was very primitive. I mean, the, the journey was very dangerous. Fact is, they nearly all died on the way back because they ran out of food and water and the, the winds weren't. Uh, conducive. I mean, you know, John Wesley came to this nation numerous times to the point where many of his contemporaries were condemning him for wasting so much time in this nation. And yet, uh, I, I, reading his journals, it, it talks about how sometimes it would take him two or three weeks just to cross the English Channel because of winds. And, uh, you, you know, so again, there's so much we take for granted in this generation. But I really believe, you know, one of the things that so blessed me was reading George Whitfield, how often he was praying for a lost world. He was, Lord, Lord, save everyone. He was crying out for, for everyone. He had a heart for, for the people in, in Africa, even though he wasn't African. He had a, he had a heart for the people in, in, in America, even though he wasn't American. He, he had a heart for a lost and a broken generation. And we have to rediscover that heart again. We have to rediscover a heart uh, for, for a world that is broken and that is on its way to hell. We are not here to, to stand and critique and, and, and look down our noses at anybody. Yes, we don't apologize for what we believe, and, and we're not going to compromise what we believe because there are those in this generation who demand that you change what you believe in order to prove that you love somebody, but that is not true love. You know, that, that is, that, that's compulsion, amen? And, and again, we're called to love our neighbor, but the reality is we cannot endorse their behavior because the principle still stands. Jesus said, he who has never sinned cast the first stone. Absolutely. It's a gospel of grace, and we must offer grace to a suffering and a lost and a dying world. However, too many people quote Jesus on that by saying, he who is without sin cast the first stone. It didn't end there. Then he turned to him and said, go your way and sin no more. Jesus declared in Mark chapter 1, repent and believe the gospel. We cannot just preach a, a gospel whereby you believe and whereby you sign up for the benefits of salvation. No, it starts at repentance. And let me say this, repentance is somewhere we must go on a daily basis. Lord, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our prayerlessness. Forgive us for our laziness. Forgive us for the fear of man. Because the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. Lord, forgive us, Lord God, for not, for not caring enough, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you will change our hearts. 
I don't know if you saw that. I saw the Spirit of God so powerfully on my wife earlier. And I saw the love of God just flowing through her and, and causing that, that, that brokenness um, for people. Because you know what? Particularly those of us in ministry, it, you can become hardened. And, and particularly by what's happening around the world at the moment, the easiest thing for us to do is to retreat into our own little respective bubbles. But that's not how God wants us to live. He doesn't want us to be narcissistic. He doesn't want us to be selfish or self-absorbed. He wants us to have a heart for the world that he died for. For God so loved the world. If the worship group could come forward. For God so loved the world. Remember that church. That person may be completely confused or deluded or full of the devil, but God loves them. And to their dying day, to their final breath, he's going to be extending his grace to them. But God forbid that we confuse the issue by endorsing them in their sin. We cannot do that. We do not have the right to do that. Jesus bore our sin on the cross. And our sin was so serious that God had to sacrifice his son. So God forbid that we change the gospel from repent and believe to just simply believe and receive. Lord, we love you. Could you just lift your hands to the Lord right now? Could you just begin to thank him for his grace? You know, I was here last night. There was, the worship practice was going on and you know, there's so many people who, who work hard to make this happen because we have to set up, we have to tear down on a weekly basis and there's a lot of work goes into it. But you know, I was outside just putting the final touches to my message and they started playing a, a, a tune that just brought me back. It brought me back to the To the early 90s and particularly to the late 80s when you know Reiner Bonnke's far conferences were going on and I wasn't even saved then but I used to watch the videos and I used to hear the worship and you know there was a move of the spirit back then that was very very powerful and in some ways we just we haven't seen that same impact in our generation and I think one of the reasons is because we are we are compromised we're lukewarm we're half-hearted but you know God wants to restore that passion you see, we're called to shine. The book of Isaiah says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. And we're living in those days, clearly. But it says, The Lord shall arise upon you, and His glory shall be seen upon you. So I want us to just take a few moments to minister to the Lord and praise. And this is what Pastor John was talking about was back then a lot of the songs were very simple. You didn't have to look at a screen because they were just simple. And I think we need to come back to that simplicity. So many of the songs today is just words and words and words and words and, and so many of it is about my feelings and about me and this is what about me. It's not about you. It never was and never will be. It's about Him. It's about His glory. It's about His kingdom. It's about His plan. It's about the world that He died for. So can we stand to our feet? And let's just lift our voices in praise as we sing this old, old song. Shine, Jesus, shine. Glory to God because He is the light of the world. He is the answer. And let's lift Him up today right now in Jesus' name.